Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you all. Um, well, this morning, I'm thinking uh, what I'd like to talk about is um, uh, bad stuff, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> uh, there's a phrase that was kicked around. Well, I must put it this way, too. That I, I feel like maybe many of us these days are feeling like we're living in uh, times when a lot of bad stuff is going on. And, um, uh, and so I'd just like to maybe um, say a few things about that. And then uh, maybe you'll, you'll have some questions or things you'd like to discuss. Um, so, cause I don't know how long my remarks will be this morning. I, uh, I can never tell for sure. <laughs> I may go on with, with things, but I'm not really planning to say a, a, a lot uh, this morning, but we'll see how it goes. But anyway, um, it, it was, uh, I remember some years ago, I used this uh, little thing. Actually, it was probably back in the 70s or 80s, possibly, uh, when this kind of uh, phrase was was popular, and um, which I, I'm not going to use, but it was, uh, I'll just say stuff happens. And uh, and the, the the word that was used for that is a bit crude, so I'll, I'll avoid it here, but perhaps you know the word. <laughs> but anyway, I'll just say so. But the implication in that word is that bad stuff happens, you know. And uh, and so I, I I had this list, uh, somebody gave me this many years ago. Now, I, I'm sure I talked about it once at some point, 20, 30 years ago, maybe. Or, anyway, uh, on this list, it has the different religions of the world are listed. And it starts out with uh, Taoism. And it just simply says, uh, bad stuff happens. But it does it in one word, the bad stuff part is just a single word. <laughs> but bad stuff happens. And then uh, the various religions, I don't, I'm not gonna list them all, because I don't know how people might react to um, uh, to the various uh, listings here, but um, uh, and then some are just kind of silly, I guess. But uh, well, Hinduism, uh, bad stuff has happened. This bad stuff has happened before, and uh, 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 I'll try to get a good. Well, here's Catholicism: is if bad stuff happens, I deserved it, and uh, that's uh, that's one of them. Protestantism, just to balance that out perhaps uh, bad stuff won't happen if I work harder you know and I was raised in in that tradition so I can kind of uh, relate to that but they list all kinds of uh, uh, things here and um, but um, among them are uh, the list here is Buddhism which basically just says uh, if bad stuff happens it isn't really bad stuff and um, now, I don't know about the other religions that are listed here, and I could go on, I got quite a few, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm reluctant to do that. But if bad stuff happens, it isn't really bad stuff, and um, that's Buddhism. And I don't know about the other religions, how well these lines capture them. Maybe there's some... Uh, I mean, like I said, I was raised Protestant, and yeah, if bad stuff won't happen if I work hard. Yeah, that was part of the work ethic, whatever I was raised with. Um, but um, in the case of Buddhism, uh, I think that this really does uh, get to a very subtle point that, uh, in Buddhist teachings. But I also think it can um, be taken in a very um, superficial way, or can even be t taken in a way where it seems like uh, it's just so much denial or something like this that you're really not, you know, facing reality uh, or thing. You know, so bad stuff happens, but it isn't really bad stuff. Like a bit of a cop out or something like that. And uh, but but that isn't it at all. That isn't what is being said here. Um, bad stuff happens it isn't really bad stuff well what is it if bad stuff stuff happens 
And as I said, right now, I think many of us probably feel that in a very large scale, at an all pervasive uh, scale here, and reaching into every aspect of our lives, bad stuff is happening. And it looks like it's gonna continue, at least for a while. Of course, in a sense, isn't bad stuff always happening? Um, but again, what is bad stuff? And uh, this is, uh, you know, what we will look at in, in Buddhism without really labeling it bad stuff. But we just look at life, at reality as it's coming up and what we're dealing with, what we're facing every day, every moment, and what is coming up here. And we, can we characterize it in some way as bad stuff or good stuff or whatever? Of course, we have a teaching that we, and I've, I've used it plenty of times, you know, uh, about the wise Chinese farmer. Those of you who've heard me talk before, no doubt you've run into this <laughs> with me talking. Uh, who can say what's good or bad, says the wise Chinese farmer, as his fortunes, you know, seem to turn day by day as neighbor comes over to either commiserate with him for the bad stuff that happened or, or to congratulate him for the good stuff. And the farmer would only say time after time, well, who can say? And that's, you know, you've heard this plenty of times and that, and that can uh, also start to seem like, okay, yeah, so it depends on how you look at it or how you're facing it and and uh, but still, bad stuff happens. Um, what is it? And I and I already indicated here that I think that this point here that if bad stuff happens, it isn't really bad stuff. This gets really to the the heart of the Buddha's insight. And if we can see this, you won't really have. Uh, that much uh, of a hard time, I, I don't think, with what we're facing now or at any time in your life, really. Even though still difficult times will come. This is not a denial of that. It is not putting it aside or closing our eyes or putting on rose-colored glasses or something like that. Uh, that's, that's not Buddhism at all. Buddhist teachings uh, are about directing our attention right to what is taking place moment by moment. And if we can actually uh, see what is taking place moment by moment, we will not get caught up in ideas and thinking about bad stuff or good stuff. When we see the world in those terms. And I want to explore this. Why do we see the world in those terms? When we, when we do, which is pretty normal for most of us, this is how we see things. Well, this is good, that's bad. I want to avoid <laughs> the things that are bad, which of course is stuff that's, for the most part, it's stuff that's bad for me. It's hurtful to me. It's uh, scary to me. It's you know, uh, sickening to me. Um, and that's kind of how we're we're, we're taking things, but we can also, in the other stuff, the, the good stuff, we go to the, the opposite direction with it too. Oh, this is wonderful, this is great. I am so lucky that this happened and all of that. Either way, we're just really tossed about. <laughs> and then over time, pretty soon, wow, this was so good. Like the wise Chinese farmer the next day, well, turned out because of that, now this happened and that, that's not so good. But then something else happens. And, on and on, uh, on and on it goes. That right there does tell us, and I've used that story plenty of times, and, and that does tell us something about how we, we shouldn't really be too tossed away by the fortunes, good fortunes or bad fortune of the, of the moment or of the day or of the time. Um, but even so, that is still somewhat Superficial. Well, I wouldn't call it superficial anymore at this point. If we could really see that and start to live and remind ourselves from moment to moment. Now, we don't need to be so caught up in this moment. If it's really a, a sad and painful moment for us, a frightening moment, it will pass. It will pass. Of course, be 
replaced by other things. <laughs> and but not only will this sort of thing pass, but it'll return too. And the good stuff, the happy times. And even though it might seem at in bleak times that you'll never have another happy moment. You know, I've been there. We've all known that, I think, from time to time. But it, times change, things move on. Uh, but we uh, will grasp the, at these moments and then we identify some as, well, this is good, this was happy, this was, you know, and I want that. I want some more of that. I, want, I hope that will happen to me again. Uh, one of the religions kind of, kind of relates to this in a way, uh, but I don't dare uh, recite it here. I shouldn't have brought that up, I'm sorry. But anyway, but uh, uh, you know, anyway, but this, this, this is where we are and, and, and it's so easy for us to be uh, tossed about. But beyond just noting that, uh, which is quite true, who can say what is good? How can you interpret what is happening to you now or in this moment, either to you personally or on a larger scale around you in your society or, or whatever? Who can determine this? When the circumstances that might fall from this are gonna come out in all sorts of ways. And any one of those, well, who can say? Yeah, there, there's, there's, there's some real truth to that. But more than that, in Buddhism, that's actually kind of a Taoist way of thinking, which is quite compatible with Buddhism. Uh, and so we, we don't you know, put this down. And that's an important thing to remember, if you can just bring yourself back to that uh, in, a, in, a, in a painful moment. Just remember that this will change, and in ways you can't predict very often. And in Buddhism, too, we don't encourage you to try to make the favorable circumstances come about. Don't work too hard on that. I mean, maybe a small scale. A little bit here and there. But the reason for that is, is because you're putting your mind in, well, can I say a bad place? <laughs> as opposed to a good place? I won't say a bad place as opposed to a good place because this is the problem that we suffer from, is that we think of things in those terms. And what the, uh, the deep, the two great deep insights of the Buddha, what he came to realize, and what his teaching is based on, uh, that would be helpful if we could uh, remember these, if we could, bring, the problem is that we can't really understand them, at least when we first hear them. It takes a while. But the one is, of course, that we don't find a permanent self, that we aren't something here that is persisting, not just me, myself, my body, my mind, my feelings, my emotions, my thoughts. None of this is persisting, and that's pretty easy to identify, to notice that this is, yeah, that's the case, really. <laughs> but even so, we have a deep underlying conviction that there is something here, me, I, that is persisting. And even though these uh, non-persisting things, these uh, flighty things that come and go, well, they still keep washing over me. And some are good and some are bad. But some I like and some I don't want to have at all. Uh, and so we're now tossed away once again. But we don't quite understand when the Buddha pointed out that we don't find a self. If we don't find any, and really what he's saying is we don't find anything persisting. Not in the field of stuff out there that appears to be coming and going, or even here within whatever it is you might think of as yourself. Whether it is your body or some aspect of your mind or your beliefs or, or something, whatever it might be. You don't find anything that's persisting. And, uh, and yet, uh, even though uh, when we first approached this, I remember when I first heard this, I was actually quite young, I was eight or nine years old when, I first, uh, when this was first pointed out to me, Buddhism teaches this. 
utterly, ba even as a kid, I mean, it was just utterly baffling to me. I couldn't understand that at all. And into my early adult years, it still was very strange, very mysterious. So gradually, I was realized there's something about this that I didn't understand. And why would anybody say this? What would they come up with? It? And what are they even looking at? And I'd long ago, by that time, passed the crazy things that, you know, we might think of, like when you go look in a mirror, well, there I am. I mean, I can see myself there, you know. It's, it's, we're, the Buddha's insight is going way beyond <laughs> questions such as, of course, there's, there you, there's your image in a mirror. Ever changing, but there it is. And um, uh, so we can start to realize in, in coming back to this and noticing this, we can start to see that there isn't anything that is persisting within the experience. Gradually, what we can wake up to is this is what this is life. This is this is why we have this lively experience of, of everything here in, the, in this lively nature you know, of things. Um, though we don't have to necessarily become elated over that and start to celebrate it or something. I mean, that's, that's fine too. We might feel that way, <laughs> but that is what we will we'll tend to do. What's that again? Well, that's our grasping, you see, and we like that, you know, that there's this life and all that. Yes, wow. And we can feel great gratitude for it. You know, I, I certainly feel that. But what's the grasp about it? It's really just a matter of recognizing it and seeing, you know, just what this is. You know? But the other thing that's linked to this, this is kind of really where I wanted to go this morning, I think, is uh, in assuming that we have this permanent self here that's enjoying or dreading or hating all of these things that come and go. Well, we hate some and rejoice in others and all, all, all of that. You know that. But, I, but it is all fleeting, coming and going. Of course, we're constantly being replaced with other stuff coming along. <laughs> this is, and that is our, that's what it, the, the, this life is. Yeah, but it'll come to an end. Well, yeah, we think that because we see, well, I'm this thing that's persisting now, and I'll come to an end. Now there's some dread in that. But, the, but that dread or that rejoicing, whatever the feeling might be, is there because we grasp. And the, and the grasping is there because we think there's something there to be grasped. But this is just our thinking. This is just the assumptions uh, that we have. It doesn't come from direct observations of what is experienced moment after moment in such a way that you've never known anything else but this continuous appearance of coming and going, this continuous appearance of change and not recognizing that is, I could say is what your life is, but that is just what life is. That is reality. And that doesn't change. The thing that we long for and look for that we'll pin and try to pin ourselves down as this thing that doesn't change me, and this is the thing I want to preserve here, you won't find anything like that, as a Buddha's insight. But there is this, uh, can I say, it's not a thing, but there is this aspect of life that it is all, it's always thus. And how is it? Well, it is just what it is experienced moment by moment, continuously. And, uh, uh, and so, and seeing uh, things in that way. And then with this too, this is the important part here, is that if we truly see that, can't be an intellectual seeing, intellectually perhaps many of you already, yeah, I, you grasp this idea that I'm putting, and there's an idea that kind of, you know. But I'm trying to, there's something more than just an idea here. There is the actual, this role experience of this and, and realizing that this is truly what the reality is. This is the very thing that cannot be grasped. And yet it is experienced, it is seen, it is felt. Uh, and this is what we need to wake up to. It's hard to wake up to that when there's this other 
uh, aspect of our, is our conceptual experience that is constantly shouting and screaming and rejoicing vocally or in any other way <laughs> uh, and uh, drowning out our ability to truly notice that I don't even, I don't, the words fail here, but I was going to say like the basis of all of this that is taken, but it's just, it's not, but then it makes it sound like it's a thing. It's not a thing. It's, it's, it's a very liveliness that is actually happening, but it is not of any particularness. It is, but it is simply always thus. And if we see that, if we realize that, if we can awaken to that, uh, then you can see how when these other things do come along, they're passing by the times we are living in, all of this, as well as the individuated little things and the bigger things uh, that are also coming on phys physical things, uh, mental you know, objects of concepts, ideas, thoughts, beliefs, all of it. We can see when we see the true nature of what is passing by and the wonderful, glorious, but also intimidating sometimes <laughs> and scary aspects of this, then uh, we don't need to be uh, so tossed away. And as times become perhaps uh, seemingly very frightening for us, you know, very difficult, threatening, or goes to the happy side too, but even though so, we don't need to be carried away. Still, we can enjoy the, the happy moment. We will feel the sadness. We lose a loved one. We can feel the sadness. Maybe sob and feel you know, deeply that sadness. But it flows on and moves on. And here it is. Again, just this moment always coming up, still alive, still will have memories of the happy times that are now gone, seemingly forever. <laughs> Were they ever really here though? But gone. Because in a sense, all of this is gone. All of this has yet to arrive. Uh, and when is it actually here? Well, what this is right here now, this is uh, the life that's being lived out. Is what it is. And it holds death, loss, all of this is right in, it's in the richness of everything that is taking place. And um, to the extent that this becomes, and if we see it, if we truly see it, this will become more real than I'm here, sitting here in front of a table talking to, that's real enough, it's tangible. I can feel my desk in front of me here where I can see the computer, all you guys on the screen. That's why I pause at the beginning. I gotta get it back into the gallery view. I wanna look at as many of you as I can. So I know that I'm actually talking to a group of people <laughs> instead of myself. So, but anyway, but uh, but that's, that's what I'm experiencing. And same for you, what you're experiencing. Uh, and this isn't a denial of, of any of that. But when we see the true nature of what is unfolding here, um, if we truly see this, then even though, yes, we can, we'll feel the sadness, you know, the happiness, the, whatever it is that the moment is calling for, that it's bringing to us, and it's all passing away. Uh, if we truly understand this, and uh, and and you, this requires kind of a minimum, um, what can I say, uh, uh, involvement of yourself, and that is just kind of quieted down. It doesn't even really need to show up. <laughs> Much of the time, even even though we're not fully awake to what's taking place, it doesn't show up. You're not constantly thinking about yourself and that sort of thing. And yet still, very quickly, it's right there and governing what you might do next or say next or, or think or whatever. 
but it is possible and, and, it, and it doesn't mean that once we wake up that we lose that entirely either you know but the shift that occurs here is that we can finally see and we're living out of the true nature of what is unfolding here rather than out of the phantoms of the various things that that come and go and carry us away and this is a you know great great freedom uh, for us so we have this phrase here that buddhism then buddhism uh, in uh, buddhism says that if bad stuff happens <laughs> It isn't really bad stuff. It could seem like a phrase like that if bad stuff happens, but it isn't really bad stuff. So it's like, yeah, we can just talk ourselves out of it. We can, um, you know, kid ourselves and something like that. But that isn't it at all. There is a very subtle understanding that comes with this. And this is, uh, and, and this is something, you don't need to figure this out. This is not an intellectual proposition. It's not a, it's not a proposition of any kind. It's not a, an argument. It's not a hypothesis. It is a matter of just really carefully looking at what is taking place here. And you will we'll see directly for yourself that you cannot get all of it in any way. You can't characterize it in any way. Oh, another point, too, I wanted to make about this. Uh, that I, I, did, I was going to make it earlier and I did <laughs> skip over it. Uh, and that is to even put things in terms of good or bad uh, is not, the awakened don't do this. It isn't a matter because good and bad, this belongs to this world of our grasping and, then, and governed by our likes, our dislikes and, and, uh, and, and things of this nature. Um, what the concern is, what the focus is, is what the awakened see. It, they're just looking at in terms of, of wholesomeness, as opposed to um, being too concerned with the particulars, which comes with the grasping. The particulars is is it belongs exclusively to uh, our world of conceptualizing. You know, the world of this and that, the world that we constantly. Uh, are occupied with and want to arrange in ways that please me, you know, that keep me comfortable and, uh, and, and not living out of fear and this sort of thing. And, uh, and many of these things, uh, to the extent that we are grasping, are going to, well, they'll be thwarted. They're, 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 there will be f fearful things. Like right now, we're coming up in very unsettled times. And I think for many of us, it is quite fearful, you know, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's troubling for me too, but I'm, I'm not losing sleep over it or anything of that sort, uh, even though I am deeply concerned about it. In fact, I've been talking lately on these kinds of talks in an effort to maybe, you know, uh, help us to regain our sane minds and, and uh, things of this sort. So the, the last several talks, so well, actually since we've been doing this uh, Zooming thing, have been kind of, it's sort of been in the back of my mind much of the time. So, uh, but still, because I do think it is quite serious and something that we need to be giving attention to. And there's things I feel like I, I could point out, you know, for, for any, of, any of you who might be interested in anything I might have to say. Um, so, so I'm not dismissing any of this at all. But then it's another thing to uh, well, kind of lose our, our minds uh, over this and that sort of thing. Still, we can really feel. I remember when I got word that uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. You know, it just really, it just felt like it just took the wind out of my sails. It was just, you know, and and so uh, the other thing too, like with finally waking, if we can be awake to what is taking place here. Sometimes people think, well, gosh, if you uh, become enlightened or something, you're just going to go sailing easy and you won't feel any pain. Or that's not true. You don't become like a cold fish and you lose all your <laughs> emotional feelings or reactions or things like this. You're a human being. This doesn't change. So it isn't a matter that we become numb to it or it becomes glossed over or, you know, something like that. It, uh, yeah, bad stuff happens, but it's not really bad stuff. It's nothing like that at all. Uh, 
bad stuff. Yeah, we can understand what that is. But to call it bad, to label it that way, and then that throws it into this dualism that, where we can, it has a flip side then. Well, we want the good stuff. We want, um, and, and with that, we will continue to make life a struggle and trying to work it and twist it and, you know, bend it into a way that makes sense, you know, for, for, for me, especially, but of course then we say, well, yeah, but for all of us, my friends, my nation, my country, my, my world, my planet, um, all of that. Uh, but uh, it's, it's that throwing it into those terms of good and bad. The awaken, they, the focus is not on good versus bad, it's on what is wholesome versus what is unwholesome. And what is wholesome? I don't, it, this isn't wholesomeness like Wonder Bread. I don't know, does that even makes? is that even around anymore? <laughs> Whole, it's wholesome in what, I don't know, different ways or I don't, I, the average, it was from my childhood, I guess, I don't remember now. But, uh, you know, so it's like wholesome, but which is that white bloom bread isn't particularly wholesome, really. But, um, uh, but it's not wholesome in that way, in, in, in that sense, as opposed to unwholesome, which uh, necessarily then means it has to be bad or something like that. Because we're not talking good and bad here. We're talking reality, which is there is of the whole, which is of the perceptual, which is of the direct experience which is of uh, seeing birth and death in each moment. That is, and that is the very uh, life that is uh, being lived out and that this never changes, it is always thus. That is of the wholesome. And then there are, there's the world of the particulars, the world of you and me and this and that and the computer screen and, and uh, here I am in my, my study here, in spite of what, what it looks like out my back window here. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, and I don't want you to see much there. That's why I put on a false. You know, I, I I keep a messy uh, study here. Too many things, problem, books and stuff, whatever. Anyway, uh, but um, uh, but the uh, it's it's a matter of seeing things in terms of 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 the wholesome, rather than uh, in terms of good. And, uh, and seeing things in terms of what is uh, not wholesome. And not wholesome just simply means is not considering the whole. Uh, for example, again today, using our political uh, you know, situation, I know some of you aren't here in the US, but, uh, but you see what's going on. And uh, the US is a big enough place and country and influential enough, at least it has been, uh, we've, we've lost a lot of it now, but, uh, where people would be concerned, but uh, with what goes on here. But um, um, it's not the, the, the stuff that's in the air that we uh, feel and breathe. And I, and I don't mean just the smoke, but I would include that too. Uh, though at least here it's become a little less smoky. We've had, even here in Minnesota, we had this reddish uh, sun, you know, uh, all day long from s smoke coming from the fires out west. But uh, all of these things, particularly these things that we do, we human beings do, with our powerful, unlike any other animal on this planet, we have these, in these incredible powers of of mind and uh, technology and all of this that we can make such uh, huge uh, you know, differences. But when our minds are only seeing things in terms of the fractured world of this and that, I remember years ago, I was uh, uh, working as a surveyor many, many years ago now. <laughs> and uh, uh, anyway, but there was a, one of the people I worked with on the crew that I was on uh, was from the prairies of the, you know, the middle United States here, where there wasn't a tree. He grew up without trees. It was just flat and treeless, you know. And, uh, uh, and I remember we were working on this thing that looked like we would have to, uh, you know, tell the builders, you know, it was, it was big construction and stuff, but they wouldn't have to move <laughs> or, or destroy these trees, take down these trees. And uh, and to this person, it's like, well, they're just trees. You don't need trees because he wasn't for him. You know, you can live a life without trees. But that's all I meant. It was just a commodity. 
and it was just, uh, you know, these trees are in our, in our way here. Uh, we can just remove them. Well, there's many other things, you know, that are taking place there. It isn't just the trees alone. But, and of course, this was a small thing relative to the size of the earth and all of that, you know, but still we carry out these kinds of things. We want to take oil from the North Slope of Alaska without really realizing this is a pristine ground. Well, that's, we have it's frozen, it's way up there, there there's nothing growing up there. We'll, we'll, we'll have uh, attitudes like this when we see things in a fractured way, not realizing that that North Slope even though nobody lives there, very few, uh, it's connected to the rest of the planet in all sorts of subtle ways. Um, so it's a matter then of not losing the, the awakened. Do not lose sight of the whole. I pointed this out many times. That's something uh, to remember. And so it, 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 it isn't that they do not lose sight of the good, because the good can't be established even by the awakened. That's not the way to see it because good will be something pitted against bad. But we can see uh, what is being looked at in a very limited way. Well, there's profits to be made by taking that oil from the North Slope. You know, that's the focus. So we make everything else come around to that. Never mind what else is going on on this planet. Uh, or we can remove these trees, right? Because <laughs> I also have a background in biology. And I, I, uh, I don't remember now what my concern was about those trees, but I realized that that wasn't the way. <laughs> it would cause trouble, problems. Anyway, so it's, it's a matter of, of as, as best we can, like I say, the awaken, uh, living out of awakeness, you don't lose sight of the whole. You're looking at things in, in these terms. And it doesn't mean that we can't act in the small sphere, you know, and, uh, and remove this or replace this with something else here and there, but very carefully. Uh, we didn't really understand the subject, the laws of ecology and that sort of thing uh, back in the earlier days of uh, uh, exploration and expansion and all of that, where we would move into uh, territories, uh, you know, and uh, bring in new plants and animals and things like this. There was a woman back in the, what was it, the 19th century who, I think it was a woman, but uh, who she, it was a nice thought, it was a beautiful thought. She wanted uh, all the birds that were ever mentioned by Shakespeare, she wanted to have them uh, transplanted to England. <laughs> and so, and, and she was very wealthy, I guess, and so she carried out to some of these, but it, it was a perfectly innocent thing because I think, well, you, you know, you put these birds here, what will they do? I mean, they're just birds and, and uh, well, yeah, but uh, there's ecology. There's, uh, you know, these things are all interconnected and they're gonna act in new and strange ways. Brought the rabbit to uh, Australia and now it's overrun with rabbits because the rabbit didn't have any natural predators in Australia. And, and, they, and they breed rather quickly. It was, they have a legend or the, a reputation for that. So <laughs> anyway, but it's this sort of thing. And we can move a little more slowly. Uh, we can look outside of our own personal interest or the interest of, uh, of our family or our party or our country. Uh, and, uh, you know, take, take a, a broader view of things. And, uh, and always check your heart. Watch where you are in your personal life. You know, to the extent, to the extent of, that I've learned to not be so occupied with myself and my personal wants and things like this. Uh, I live a far happier life <laughs> now than when those things occupied me more. So, uh, and why is it well, it's living out of a, a more uh, awakened, and wholesome, open understanding? This is why too, when the Buddha, the line that I like out of the Dhammapada, I've given it to you many times, 183rd verse of the Dhammapada where he says um, to do what is wholesome, to avoid what is unwholesome, purify your own mind, watch your own mind. This is the teaching of the awakened. And it's that last line there. This, this is what the awakened teach. And that's it. Uh, and that's what we need to uh, get in touch with. 
and uh, and with this, and yeah, we would see that well, the bad stuff is not really bad necessarily. That is not you don't have to look at it that way. It might not be wholesome. Yeah, maybe there's something you know, but but now again, you're considering the whole. Uh, but we don't have to treat it as bad. Yes, yeah, get it out of here, destroy it. You know, that that isn't the approach. That isn't the attitude. That's not the spirit of this. And it's also patience and trying to be understanding. You can understand others and how they might not act in these ways because they don't know. It's never occurred to them. It's never been pointed out for them. Even when it is pointed out to us, it might take a while for us to start to see the wisdom uh, behind this. But, um, uh, and I think too, for, for those of us now in these very troubled times, I think for many of us, and again, I feel it as well, you know, too. Um, but um, it, it might be helpful for us uh, if we can come back to to this a bit. Well, I think I did finally maybe say everything that I kind of had in mind, I think. Nothing else seems to be there. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, I mean, any any questions now? Is it okay to jump in? Yes. Hello, hello. Hi. Hello. I'm just new uh, to this. I'm just like... Uh you know, got the, the Zoom meeting detail like a few days back through Jed. And uh, I mean, I just have like a, a very like basic question on this, you know, before like there were mountain and after there are no mountain, uh -huh. and now like there are mountains. Like, how do you understand that? Ah, <laughs> did, you, did you have something more? Is that it? Is that, is that the question? Yeah, I mean, I, I can tell you like how I understand it, but maybe I will let you first ah. say how you understand it. So I don't speak too much. <laughs> yeah, well, I, um, I'd like to know how you understand it. Oh, okay. So how I understand is that first, like, we think that they are like mountain, like intrinsically existing, right? So there is like an intrinsic mountain, which, which is real and exists from its own side, right? And then there are no mountain, which means that there is only this, only this moment here now, and nothing has a name. We don't know what anything is, but everything happens, you know, through causes and conditions, and then disappear when the causes and conditions are not there anymore. You know, like, like I don't know, a match. You know, I, I just lit up a match, and there is a fire there because they are causing condition for the fire. You know, the wood and the air and everything, and then when all this condition disappears, there is no fire anymore. So the same with the mountain. The mountain, so, uh, so in this moment, there is the mountain, right? In this being time, like there is the mountain, um, but we don't have to give it a name. It's just like something happens through causes and conditions. So that's the number two, where I live only in this like here now moment reality. And I don't like, you know, think about anything else. And then in the third part, it's just like, okay, conventionally I can say, I can design it as a mountain, but I have seen the magic, right? I know that in reality, this is just like an appearance which comes through causes and condition and will disappear when these causes and conditions aren't there anymore. But conventionally, just for the sake of like communication, I can say, oh, okay, that's a mountain because like we agree, like in kind of like intersubjective agreement if there is such a thing. Mm -hmm. Well, that's pretty good. Um, I would say that um, I'm gonna, go back to gallery here now. Um, but I, I would say that, uh, um, that, that that's good what you said. It, it's, it's, uh, but there, it's, uh, there's something else that's actually taking place there. Um, in when we get to number two, we realize that there is no mountain. Uh, that is that um, there is no mountain. Uh, there isn't anything at all in particular, you know, that is the mountain. And uh, this was the case all along, even when we were at number one there, where we say there's mountain, yeah, there's mountains are mountains and rivers are rivers. This is where most of us are. Uh, we're born into the world, we're, we're taught about mountains and rivers and trees and plants and people and cars and houses and all of this, <laughs> and they're all real. This is reality. It consists of all these various objects and things. That's the first one. Mountains are mountains. Rivers are rivers. It's just our conventional reality as we normally understand it. But then at some point, 
we can realize that, and it isn't just because, I was kind of alluding to this, I thought at least when, when I was talking this morning, it isn't just because we can see that everything is constantly changing. Uh, everything about the mountain uh, is, is constantly changing and, and, uh, and, and it's only kind of you know, conventionally that we'll pull it together. Uh, that, that's, that's part, we, there, there is that kind of insight. And that's, uh, that can be pretty powerful. And sometimes people think that that's it, that that's enlightenment itself is, is right there at number two. But then we can come back to the conventional view, uh, you know, so we can, uh, you know, talk together and, and, and this sort of thing. We agree, uh, this is a mountain and this is a river and that sort of thing. That would be the third, uh, as you kind of described it, I think. But actually, if we go back to number two there, what we can, it is, it's more than just seeing that uh, the mountain isn't a mountain because it is constantly changing it's, or it's made up of various parts and things that they themselves are also changing and, and this sort of thing. Uh, we can actually, at some point, we can actually see uh, that there is no mountain. There, there is nothing, <laughs> it's just, it's impossible for there to be a mountain. Uh, it, it just can't possibly be. And uh, that is seeing there's no mountain. It is impossible. There's no mountain. There's no me. There's no, you know, there's no hand. This, we can see this. And uh, there truly is not this. This can, uh, glimmers of this can start to come to us uh, sometimes when it starts to feel like uh, the the world isn't uh, quite so real as we naively thought. I remember years and years ago, my mother, uh, she just bought a new car. It was back in, uh, I guess, in 67, because I remember she bought a 67 Malibu, which was a pretty sporty car <laughs> for my mother, who was getting older than you know, it was. She was in her, uh, it was in her 60s or so. And uh, I thought, Mom, you bought... <laughs> You know, it was after I'd moved out of the house and everything. Why didn't you get a car like that when I was at home? But anyway, uh, and she was, and she drove it uh, pretty wildly too. But one day, uh, not not long after she had bought the car uh, from her house, from the kitchen window in her house, you could kind of look across the yard there, and you could see the garage. And when the garage door, which was behind, you know facing away from the house, was closed. Uh, if you looked out, say, in the evening or when it was getting dark, which is when this event took place, uh, it, it, the, the window would be darkened, you know, so she couldn't see, you know, th uh, through the window. Well, one evening, she was just having to glance out there, and she saw a light coming in through the window. And uh, so she knew something was up. It was like the, the garage door, the main door was open. So she walked out there, came around the corner of the garage, and sure enough, the, the garage door was open and her car was gone. <laughs> Somebody had broken in, and stole a car, and then as she was telling this story to me, and uh, she said, and she came back to the house. She was coming back. She was just kind of wringing her hands. She said, "It can't be! It can't be!" You know, <laughs> and uh, it's like, like this is just impossible. This can't be reality. You know, and it was such a shock for her. Turned out they found the car a few blocks away. Uh, the police, so uh, it wasn't a, a tragic ending to this story. But uh, anyway. <laughs> But, but it was that moment, I remember when she was, you know, saying that, that it can't be, it can't be. And, uh, but it's this kind of, I don't know if you've ever experienced something like that, not necessarily the shock of a loss, like, or at least you think uh, momentarily that you've lost something like that. Uh, but any number of things where you can look at it, you see it, you experience it, and you have that intense feeling that this can't be. This is that second stage. Mountains are not mountains. Rivers are not rivers. And if we actually, and it's a visceral thing, it's not an intellectual thing, it's not the idea of it. You, 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 with your gut. Of course, it isn't your gut, it's just because you, you can't be either. Uh, but with, this can be seen directly. And oftentimes people take this to be enlightenment, which is far more powerful than the one you were describing earlier. But even this is still not, this is still delusion. Then we go to that third step. 
but there's a car there, there's a hand there, there's a, a, a garage there, there's whatever. Uh, it is still here. Uh, there's a river there, a mountain. Uh, and at this point, now we can maybe realize if we actually see that and we don't get confused now, we can see what it is that, say, Nagarjuna is saying when he points out uh, that things are empty, that everything has this same taste, he said. This taste is emptiness, shunita. But it is that uh, these things are without substantiality. This can be seen and known directly. And in doing that, of course, now this matter of uh, bad stuff happens, but it isn't really bad. Now we're seeing it even at a, a more intense level than I was speaking of earlier today. But, uh, but that is what's uh, behind that. It is quite powerful. I've talked with people who think, well, with square, with three, we get back to square one. You know, now, <laughs> once again, rivers are rivers. Oh, phew, now we're back to this, but that's not it at all. We can, we can penetrate into the true nature of a river or a house or a car or whatever it might be. You, your neighbor. Uh, and this is available to us to see directly. It is not a, uh, it's not a, a, a thought, a belief, a, you know, a, 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 and I'm not making an argument here for anything. <laughs> Either we see this or we do not. And it is possible for any of us to see it because actually, because we all see this every moment. It is our perceptual experience, which does not give us a car or a house or a hand or me or you, something that relates to my name, Steve. What is uh, the perceptual, the direct, immediate, direct experience of reality doesn't give you anything. There's no car. Mountains are not mountains. Rivers are not rivers. And, but this itself is still not enlightenment. As uh, uh, since, uh, uh, who wrote uh, Emerging a Difference in Unity, anyway, but there's a line in there. Uh, Sozan, uh, uh, is that right? Anyway, there's a line there where he says, uh, merging with absolute is still not enlightenment. So at number two, it's kind of like, yeah, we've encountered now absolute. There's no mountain, no river. This is still not enlightenment. Then we go on to three. Mountains are mountains and rivers are rivers. But now it is seen and realized that they are empty. To use Nagarjuna's words, I would capitalize it only to remove it from other words we would confuse that with, like the emptiness we might feel when Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, something like that. We're not talking about that. Things are empty of substantiality. And uh, that's number three. And, but yes, yeah, so here we have a mountain, we have a river, whatever it might be. But it is, it is not of the nature that we naively thought at number one, or even at number two, when we realized that there's something about this that isn't real at all. But here it is. So my teacher used to say, here it is, whatever it might be, you hold up your hand. Here it is, but what is it? And of course, then we will try to answer that question, what, but you can't. That's posed there only for you to realize you keep pursuing that, you'll, you'll never answer it. You might come up with an answer, like, you know, the, the, at number two there, you, you, <laughs> about the mountain or the river. That is no mountain, no river. But that's still a grasp thing. That's still a concept, an idea. And that is not enlightenment. But it, uh, uh, but it's showing the, the emptiness of it. The, the, the all, every, and everything has this taste. You can look now at anything, the tree, the squirrel, the, you know, the, it doesn't have to be physical things, just a, a thought, an idea, a belief. All has the same taste as Nagarjuna would say. And this taste is emptiness, or shunyata is the word he used. Which and emptiness, I, I've started using non-substantiality now, which I think uh, maybe gets, because empty. there's problems with that word emptiness or voidness. And sometimes it's even called nothingness, which clearly is not the case because there's a hand here. This is, this is not nothing. The experience is never nothing. 
but it is finally really tasting, realizing, waking up to what the direct perceptual experience is that is always ongoing. It is the same for you as, as it is for a Buddha or an awakened person. We all taste, see, feel, experience reality directly. And it is of one taste. And if you taste it, you'll realize it. And then, of course, that can throw us into no mountains, no rivers. That's still delusion. But here's a mountain, here's a river, here's a hand, here's a, whatever it might be. But that's number three. And, uh, and there we have awakening. I usually don't go this far, <laughs> but uh, is it Yasin? But anyway, uh, yeah, but thank you for uh, bringing that up. That, did that help at all? Yes, yes, definitely. I think that uh, Nagarjuna was saying that like, it's harder to see like the emptiness of, of something when it's actually functioning. So it's easier to see like the emptiness of a broken car or a broken phone than the emptiness of the phone or the car when it's working. But even when it's working, yeah. it just appears and it doesn't belong to anyone. It's just an appearance through mm -hmm. causes and condition because I've got eyes, eyes yeah. consciousness, right. all uh, the yeah, different that, things and it yeah. appears, but it doesn't belong to anyone. Yeah, exactly. And, and you're quite mm -hmm. right. With, with that functioning, yeah, everything is pulled in with it. Yeah, that's true. And so as you see the mm -hmm. thing, you, 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 the whole universe, the whole reality, the whole of reality is appearing in every thing that is appearing here. Uh, with, that also becomes abundantly clear at the same time. When it stops being a thing for you. And, mm. Yeah, I, I just finished a book <laughs> where I get into this stuff uh, <laughs> to some degree, uh, which I think well, might be helpful. In fact, it, it's the beginning of the book, I open it with those three lines of mountains are mountains and rivers are rivers. Mountains are not rivers. Uh, mountains are not mountains and rivers are not rivers. Actually, what it says is, uh, I thought I had a copy here. Uh, I, but it's, uh, first, mountains are mountains and rivers are rivers. This is delusion. Next, mountains are not mountains, rivers are not rivers. This is necessary but still delusion, then mountains are mountains and rivers are rivers. That's the opening of my book. <laughs> That's before the book opened. I hope you don't skip over that page. <laughs> so it's almost like we create a contrast so that we can see the first one better, right? Almost. Well, it's, it's just a matter When you say of, it's necessary. Sorry. It's, it's and for awakening. It is necessary to see that rivers are not rivers and that mountains are not rivers uh, not, and mountains are not mountains. Hmm. And you are not you. you know, the <laughs> hand is not the hand. Uh, so this, this is like my mother was saying, this cannot be. The, yeah, it's a lot more than that, mom. Of course, at the time she had that experience, I didn't understand this myself. I was only, what, 20 years old or something, maybe. I don't know. Anyway, um, but I hope uh, I, I hope that helped. Thank you. Um, we've mentioned that we live at the intersection between the relative and the absolute, that we don't throw out either views. Um, and my question is, conventionally speaking, if we were living in Tibet in 1959 and we saw the Chinese coming, or if we were living as Native Americans and we saw the white man coming, would we be having this conversation uh, in the same spirit or would you be emphasizing the same points? Yes, I, I, I would have uh, emphasized the same points, yes. No, yeah, nothing, nothing would be different. The, the, what I was pointing to there is universal. And so the circumstances, because I, I was pointing to the perceptual, what the perceptual experience is, and it has nothing to do with the layout of the conceptual, how the, how the world is arranged. Also, I, I, but I, I wouldn't um, use the phrase that we live at the intersection of the relative and absolute, uh, it, 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 only because it sounds like they're two linear things that are crossing. And uh, that's really not the case. They're both kind of all pervasive. 
and we're constantly there. Uh, there's no other arrangement. It's, it's always these two together at once. And ultimately, too, and this is what occurs in the number three step of uh, mountains are mountains and mountains are not mountains, is that uh, the realization is that these are not two, the relative and absolute. Yes, thank you. Yeah, but it's, it's a matter of seeing that and uh, not a matter of uh, believing it or getting the idea. It is possible to see in that way. And that is uh, actual you know, full awakening. If, if that occurs. So, no, but thank you, Ken. I hope that helped. Yeah, actually it's, it's, it's kind of in a similar vein. Uh, <clears throat> the, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> the, one of the things that, that I get, and it's, it's happened a lot this week is I teach all my classes now Zoom, and I'll have students say, well, you know, Professor Jordan, uh, the world's ending. Did you hear she died? And one of the things that they, they say to me, it's kind of paraphrasing them. It's like, well, yeah, yeah, I know. I see all these Buddhist books in your office. And I don't want to hear that mountains or mountain stuff. Because... <laughs> Yeah. Hey, the Supreme Court's going to hell. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, you know, what 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 would you say to them in in that context? It's like that's that's nice teaching, but this is real stuff. There really is a Supreme Court. There really is a this. There really is a that. She's dead, and look at what's what's happened. Yeah. Well, I I don't think there's much of an opportunity to uh, um, lay it out in any. Uh, depth, uh, like at least not right away, because um, it takes a while for us to kind of move toward this sort of understanding. I took a few liberties here. <clears throat> Normally, I don't speak quite that way on a Sunday morning, but um, it went as far as I did go this morning. <laughs> Something just drew me on. But what you could say under those circumstances is um, that you just remind them that times change and things continue to change. And um, uh, we live in this world of, you know, coming and going, and that includes each, each of us individually, and, and certainly including uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, but we uh, are living now in living out this dynamic reality. And uh, it's a matter of just coming back to this moment here and then doing what you can. I, I might uh, remind them a little bit of just to maybe uh, realize that there is the whole of totality of where everything is taking place. And, um, and we can see things in that context rather than we got to get this point and drive it through. And pretty soon we're acting uh, in, in just a, a malicious and, uh, you know, uh, way that uh, we would view others who uh, want to attack us or, or to, you know, uh, have some kind of power over us or something like this. So it's a matter of, uh, so I'd at least try to introduce maybe a little bit of thinking about uh, putting your mind on the whole <laughs> a little bit, you know, something like that. But of course in this, and I, I also I would say even today, I didn't intend to do this, but it just sort of came up when, when I mentioned how I felt getting news that uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg had died. I mean, it was just, um, it was a blow to the gut. I mean, it was just, uh, you know, but still, we we have to go on. I think it probably took me a few days to feel like I can, you know, breathe again or something. You know, so uh, uh, it it doesn't mean that we don't feel these things and we might be upset by these things, but little by little we can maybe learn to keep keep our mind focused on on the whole picture as as much as we can. Get out of our own personal stuff, and of course, uh, this is more than yeah when. Uh, someone like uh, Ginsburg dying is more than just our personal stuff. Yeah, we, you know, and it is an enormous influence across the country and that sort of thing. But uh, still, uh, it is a matter of uh, if we can bring our, well, as the Buddha said, you know, do do what is wholesome, do what is of the whole, avoid what is unwholesome, and watch your own mind. Uh, these, I think that's a very good teaching. 
just try to and try to calm them down. <laughs> also, perhaps remind that you know, we can function a little better to the extent that we can keep our minds settled and calm, not losing sight of uh, what's actually unfolding around us, and uh, and what is malicious and uh, um, and fractured and divided and painful and all of that. Don't lose sight of that either. But don't, don't ourselves start acting in a way that's participating in that, in the fracturing and in the division and all of that. So I don't know, Michael, if, did, did, did I? Did, yeah, yeah, that's, 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 that's very helpful. I, I find that what happens is that they, <clears throat> they want to draw me into a discussion about how mm -hmm. this is it. Right. You know, you're right. This is it. Mm. It'll, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's what we'll lock down on the smaller thing, the, the, the thing that we can grapple with and get hold of and start slinging around, uh, you know, or, or we want to build up uh, all of that kind of stuff. That's, yeah, we go there right away. But it's helpful to slow down and look at the larger picture. Uh, when all else fails, I just remind them that <clears throat> I finally accept the fact that my beard is gray. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But you look very distinguished with a gray beard. <laughs> Thank you, Sid. Thank you, Michael. Good to see you. Thank you very much.